Hi, and a very warm welcome today to today's talk, which is uh, all about the ins and outs of um, a joyful belly. But before I start my talk, I want to briefly introduce myself. My name is Sabine Horner, and I'm one of the nutritionists uh, at Community HealthWorks, a charity that has been tasked to look after the physical well-being of stormwater customers and staff. So, as you can see, I'm a fully qualified functional nutritionist, which means that I look at the whole body and not just one um, finger or one system in the body like the heart but I uh, usually when I work with clients I uh, have a look at the whole medical history daily routine the food intake how much uh, um, water somebody is drinking or tea and also um, look at the medication, any food, drug interactions and also uh, supplements that somebody is taking or would need to be taking. So it's, uh, I, I usually take a very comprehensive picture of somebody's uh, health issues. I'm also a health coach, so um, I help people make changes to their diet and lifestyle that are appropriate for their life circumstances that fit in with their, diet, uh, their daily routine uh, are not uh, unrealistic. And I'm also a yoga therapist, that means that I can also include some yoga postures uh, if necessary. Um, there's uh, some specific ones that are good for the thyroid, for example or I can um, recommend some specific meditations or breathing exercises. For example, when somebody has got difficulty um, sleeping or has got a lot of stress going on in their lives. So today's topic is the ins and outs of a joyful belly and uh, about simple nutrition and lifestyle tips that can help improve your digestion. As you grow older, our digestive system needs more and more support. So what am I going to talk about? First of all, the main functions of our digestive system so that we are um, clear about that. The importance of a healthy and happy gut, signs of good digestion and the three main causes of poor digestion, simple ways uh, in which you can improve your digestion and also your poop. And then a special uh, word on acid reflux, low stomach acid and PPIs, which are proton pump inhibitors, a very common over-the-counter medication, but also something that your GP may prescribe in certain conditions. So our digestive system starts in the mouth, as you can see here, and ends with the anus and everything in between is called the digestive system. And it has three main functions to break down the food we eat into absorbable bits, um, because we just need um, the building blocks um, for energy growth and repair. Then another function is to eliminate waste products and toxins, very important function and 70% of our immune system is also in the gut. Because we share our gut with trillions of microbes and um, they are part of our immune system, especially, especially the beneficial ones, because we have got beneficial and harmful microbes in our gut. So harmful ones would be harmful bacteria, viruses, parasites, uh, yeasts and fungi. And if, yeah, looking at the number of <laughs> microbes in comparison to our own genes, we can see that we are usually outnumbered and uh, so it's super important to keep our beneficial bacteria happy 
and I will tell you how you can do this quite easily in a bit. And uh, by looking after our beneficial gut bacteria well, we can make sure that everything in the gut is in balance and that our gut is functioning well and healthy. And why is that important? Well, when we digest our food well, that gives us the energy we need um, to digest actually the next meal, but also um, use the remaining 40% for other things. We also want to prevent digestive issues such as bloating, gas, and uh, acid reflux, for example, or constipation. We want to keep our weight as stable as possible. We don't want to put on weight. We also don't want to lose weight too much. And it's also important for our mental health. Actually, 90% of serotonin, the happy hormone, is made by our beneficial gut bacteria. So it's very important to keep them happy and they will make sure that we are happy a very direct link and our skin you know is also better when our digestive system functions better and is less overwhelmed with waste products and toxins and signs that your digestive system might not be working as well as it should are as i mentioned before some digestive issues bloating belching a lot of flatulence not just a little bit, but a lot, um, diarrhea, constipation, uh, hemorrhoids, um, undigested food in the stool, floating or pale stools is a very um, important sign of poor digestion, pain in the abdomen and cramping. And indirect sy symptoms are when um, the problems are no longer confined to our digestive system but have uh, moved into the blood like toxins or undigested food and also bacteria and other microbes can move into the bloodstream when our um, gut barrier is not uh, fully intact anymore and that can cause fatigue, brain fog, insomnia, skin problems, as I uh, mentioned before, headaches, joint pain, uh, also autoimmune conditions and weight problems. So it's really important to look after our digestive system and our gut as well as we can. So if our digestion is not working properly, we are not absorbing the nutrients. So we get a lot of nutrient deficiencies, which are one of the root problems of many health issues. Now, what causes poor digestion? Now, we need three um, things for um, strong, a strong good digestion. And that's lots of blood, lots of fluids and lots of energy. Now, when we have lack of blood, um, that can be caused by stress, for example, that diverts blood away from the stomach, from the digestive system into the limbs and into the heart and the liver to run away from the, uh, in ancient times, uh, saber-toothed tiger. Now, we don't have a saber-toothed tiger anymore, but uh, our nervous system hasn't adapted really to modern day living. And so stress is still perceived as a threat. Um, when we've got lots of tension, um, for example, when we are very anxious and worried, uh, that can cause blood constriction in the stomach. But also when we eat a lot of cold, uh, especially ice cold uh, food and drinks like ice cream or ice cold water, especially before mealtimes, it's not a good idea because again, that causes blood constriction and when there's not enough blood in our stomach we can't the stomach can't break down the food properly and we get undigested foods going through the digestive system causing all sorts of problems and potentially leaking into the bloodstream where it shouldn't be and then blood deficiencies uh, like anemia can also um, cause problems with digestion so we need really strong blood um, with lots of oxygen 
um, because we need energy to break down the food. Um, so stressful life events like uh, bereavement, a major loss can sap our energy uh, drastically. Lack of nutrients uh, can cause uh, um, lack of energy and a poor diet, of course. When you eat a lot of processed foods um, that contain a lot of sugar and little fiber, that can make us constipated, can slow down our thyroid function, can make us really very tired, especially after a meal. And lack of fluids uh, is a major cause of digestion. When we are dehydrated, um, we can produce the amounts of stomach acid, digestive enzymes and bile that we need to break down the food and uh, absorb all the food particles. So, and electrolyte imbalance can also lead to a lack of fluids, like when we have uh, diarrhea constantly, that can um, decrease the electrolytes in our body, and magnesium is one of the very important ones, but also calcium, potassium, sodium, you may have heard of them. So electrolytes have a very important function in the body. They make sure that nutrients go into the cells, but also uh, that wastes are uh, moved out of the cells. So again, that ties in with uh, energy. Um, when we can't get rid of toxins in the cells, that uh, saps our energy. And uh, yeah, when we can't get nutrients into the cells, for the body to use, um, yeah, that can cause lack of energy as well. And uh, electrolytes are also very important for our water balance in general and acid alkaline balance. So just bear this in mind as we go on. So poor digestion is also linked to food cravings because uh, food di poor digestion means that we the body is not getting what it needs. Um, so and cravings are the body's way of communicating to us what it needs. So one reason why we can get cravings is nutrient deficiencies like uh, for example magnesium. We may get cravings for chocolate because dark chocolate is rich in magnesium for example or we can get cravings for meat when we are deficient in zinc or in iron because meat is rich in those minerals i've mentioned electrolyte imbalance before for example when we've got diarrhea so we can get cravings because of that and also thirst there's also a, a craving for water is also one of the cravings and then poor digestion can cause digestive issues which can cause an imbalance between the good and the harmful guys in the gut and these gut microbial imbalances can also cause cravings for example i mentioned serotonin before when we have uh, low levels of serotonin we can also get sugar and cr uh, cravings and cravings for more carbohydrates and also when our dopamine levels are low we can also get sweet cravings and um, those are two very important neurotransmitters um serotonin is very important for our moods and dopamine for our motivation for example and uh, focus in life and cravings can also uh, be due to uh, poor food choices that we make. So if we eat a, a lot of processed food, ready-made meals, for example, and cakes and biscuits and so on, we don't get enough fiber and fiber is one of the main fuels for our good back, gut bacteria. So they thrive when we eat a lot of fiber. So when we eat a lot of uh, sweets and sugary stuff, we feed the uh, harmful bacteria and yeast, fungi, parasites and viruses. So really be aware of where your food cravings are coming from and um, that food cravings are always a sign that uh, the body is not getting what it truly needs. 
So if you keep going and eating sweet stuff because you're hungry all the time, maybe you're lacking fiber to keep your blood sugar levels more stable and uh, decrease your hunger pangs. So how do we actually know that we have got good digestion? Well, one very um, telltale sign is uh, the, what comes out at the very end, our poop. So very important to actually have a look and not just uh, flush it down the drain. And type four is the ideal stool, uh, sausage-like smooth and soft banana shaped stool and um, <coughs> with very little to no smell so if your stool is very smelly then there's something going on probably a lot of toxins uh, in your digestive system that needs to uh, be eliminated and you should have a bowel movement at least once a day if you haven't got a bowel movement once a day you are already termed uh, or considered to be constipated and of course, diarrhea is not a good sign of good digestion either. Now, how can we uh, improve our digestion and our poop? The, the way it looks like when it comes out at the very end. First of all, good eating habits. That's the easiest way, really. Um, I'm going uh, to elaborate more on this uh, in a bit. Then by eating more fiber, um, improving our bile flow by eating more bitter and sour foods, um, by drinking enough, making sure that we don't flush out electrolytes or get, you know, that uh, we don't lose too many electrolytes by having constant diarrhea, by making sure we have enough uh, sources of zinc, B6 and magnesium in our diet or supplement with it if necessary. Um, by adding herbs and spices to uh, every meal, um, moving regularly every day, um, even small movements like in our yoga classes would be beneficial. Squatting on the toilet instead of just sitting there with the feet on the floor, lift your feet up and that will make it easier to eliminate and review certain medication like PPIs, which I mentioned in the introduction. So the best 10 eating habits, what are they? Well, eat in a calm and stress-free environment is the first one. Um, chew well, because um, digestion starts in the mouth. Savor your food, that increases digestive juices and makes it easier to process the food, a regular daily meal routine, I'll elaborate on that one, a main meal at lunchtime if possible, like in former times, our, you know, like generations before us, they knew why they were eating their main meal at lunchtime when our digestion is at its strongest, have an early and light dinner, not like us, having, you know, a steak in the evening is not very conducive to good digestion, Avoid overeating, um, eat only when truly hungry, and I'll go into that as well. Avoid difficult to digest foods and avoid cold drinks of food, which I already mentioned because that just constricts blood flow and makes it difficult for the stomach to process the food. Now, eat in a calm and stressful environment. So relaxing before and after a meal would be very beneficial. And the best way to do this is by taking three deep breaths before and after a meal. So if you've never heard of deep breathing before, you may want to try it together with me now. If you put your hands on your tummy and close your eyes for a moment and just notice where your, where your breath is at this moment in time. Is it in your chest or is it in your tummy? And also notice the depth of your breath. Is it deep or is it shallow? And notice how your tummy is moving 
in what direction when you are inhaling and when you are exhaling. So when we inhale, like now, take a deep breath in, we should relax the tummy muscles outwards and fill our belly with a lot and lot of air and blow it up like a big balloon. And when we exhale, we pull the tummy muscles towards the spine and we let all the air come out and we make our tummy as flat as possible. And this then makes it easier to relax the tummy muscles out again on the inhale, blowing up the belly like a big balloon, filling it with air and exhaling pulling the tummy muscles again towards the spine. You can open your eyes again. So this, as you may have noticed, um, calms our nerves um, and makes it easier to digest our food because it actually ups our digestive enzyme production by 25%. That's uh, a whooping 25%. And um, digestive enzymes are the molecules that help break down the food into smaller food particles. <coughs> um, a regular daily meal routine with little snacking in between times also helps with good digestion. Um, so our body loves routine and when we eat at certain regular times each day our body just knows when to produce adequate levels of stomach acid digestive enzymes and bile so ideal meal times i say ideal <laughs> uh, are so breakfast by eight o'clock in the morning at the latest lunch between 12 and 2 and dinner by seven if possible so um, and that just keeps our body clock working, our natural body clock. And as I said, main meal at lunchtime is just uh, the best time because our digestion is just very strong at lunchtime and it diminishes, the di our digestive strength diminishes with every hour uh, after that. So always eat difficult to digest foods before five o'clock. Um, and I'll come back to difficult to digest foods. <clears throat> and yeah, avoid uh, snacking in between times. I know that can be very challenging. So I always recommend to clients to check in with their emotions before they put any food in their mouth when they are, and also check in with their hunger. Are, are you truly hungry or is there an emotion that's driving you to eat something? And, and try to find out what emotion is driving and feeding your food cravings and what food you're craving actually. You know, there's many emotions that can make us uh, eat too much, um, but also stress and anxiety um, because food is just calming and soothing <coughs> and comforting. So a need for comfort can be a big driver for overeating. And snacking has the adverse effect of reducing the levels of stomach acid, digestive enzymes and bile that we need to break down the next food we eat. So if we snack a lot, there won't be enough of these uh, digestive juices to process our next meal. And our next meal is actually, hopefully, uh, lunch or dinner and uh, it will be a larger meal which needs more of the digestive juices. And what we eat is also very important for our digestion. So there's, uh, it's very important to have a very varied diet. Varied because um, we don't know um, exactly, you know, like there's a lot of research going into what um, 
bacteria and microbes are living in our gut, but there are some bacterial strains we will never really know uh, about because they live in an anaerobic environment and can't survive um, being exposed to air and oxygen. So we just need to make our diet as varied as possible so that we include a lot of different food with different sorts of fiber. And as I said before, fiber is the preferred fuel of our good bacteria. And by including a lot of different sorts of fiber, we just feed all of the bacteria, uh, the beneficial bacteria, and we don't have to worry about uh, not feeding one or the other strain properly. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, so, um, and it's also very important to have a well-balanced diet. So well-balanced means more than 50% of your plate should be filled with vegetables. And it can be also some root vegetables and whole grains. And a tiny portion should be protein, like 25 gram. We don't need a huge steak. We only actually need four tablespoons of meat at any one time. And we also need beneficial oils. Um, every cell in our body and also every nerve cell needs to be nourished with healthy oils. And healthy oils are coconut oil, olive oil, sesame oil, avocado oil, flaxseed and hemp seed oil, for example. But not the refined oils that you get in a plastic transparent bottle in the supermarket. That's just uh, oil that's completely ruined and is not very good for your health. So the easiest way to get more fiber and more variety of um, vegetables into your diet is by eating a rainbow. Just include uh, as many colorful vegetables as you can find in a supermarket, for example, in a stir fry, or uh, put it in an omelet, you know, um, make every meal or turning every meal into a rainbow meal is uh, what I usually say. You can even make a uh, hummus more colorful by adding a beetroot or a carrot or an avocado. And just uh, to expand on the benefits of a stir fry, um, I've discovered cooking for only myself that a stir fry has so many benefits. Um, it's, as I said, the easy, one of the easiest ways to get more fiber and more variety into your diet. It is also very easy to combine with any source of protein, apart from milk, because milk is fluid. Uh, but uh, you can combine it with uh, cooked lentils and beans, uh, heat it up. Um, you can combine it with falafel, with um, any sort of meat, oily fish, uh, buckwheat noodles, um, you name it, uh, you know, it's uh, <coughs> uh, quinoa, for example, is also a good one. It's uh, very easy to make. It requires no cooking skills and also no wok. Uh, you can make it on autopilot. You don't need a recipe for it. You can just use any leftover food that you have in your cupboard and fridge and you can turn it into a very tasty stir fry. It will always look and taste different. Um, if you do that, and you can adapt it to one, two or more persons very easily. And it's very quick. You only need 12 minutes to make it, and I've timed this. Um, food swaps are also important. I mentioned that um, a lack of zinc, B6 and magnesium can cause poor digestion. Why? Because zinc and uh, B6 are needed to, for stomach acid production and also magnesium. And magnesium is also a very essential component of saliva, which can be a problem uh, in uh, elderly people. So simple food swaps um, that can increase your zinc Intake, for example, could be eating more lentils, chickpeas, and beans, but also eating more sesame, pumpkin seeds, or hemp seeds. And cashews and almonds are also rich in zinc. And B vitamins, 
B6 uh, is found in salmon, which is an oily fish, which would be really good to include with to have with a stir fry, for example. Or chicken liver can also be combined with a stir fry. B6 is also in carrots, in spinach, sweet potatoes. That would be a good swap. Instead of eating white potatoes, eat more sweet potatoes. Also, they have more fiber than white potatoes. And again, chickpeas have got uh, a lot of B6 in them and bananas and avocado. So, and, and magnesium can be found in almonds and pumpkin seeds, but also in dark chocolate. So if you want to snack, eat more dark chocolate. And with, with dark chocolate, I mean, you know, higher than 70% and I always say, if you're not used to dark chocolate, just gradually increase the cocoa content in chocolate from 35 to maybe 45 to 55 to 65 and so on until your taste buds have adapted to the more bitter taste. And, uh, and speaking about taste buds, zinc is also very important for our sense of taste. So if you've got a lack of taste, then you may have a lack of zinc. And zinc is very important for our immune system. <laughs> it uh, stops the multiplication of uh, a virus. So what foods would improve our digestion? So I've already mentioned some which uh, are very beneficial because of their nutrient content, the mineral and vitamin, but also antioxidant content and avoid difficult to digest food. What is difficult to digest? Any heavy and dense food like red meat is heavy, wheat is very dense and heavy, and cheese is then heavy. Combining meat with cheese makes uh, a burger, for example, a meat and cheese burger, a Mac burger, very difficult to digest because you need different enzymes to digest these two protein sources of protein, the meat and the cheese. Cold and raw food is very difficult to digest because it first needs to be cooked in the stomach before it can be broken down. So that can cause gas and bloating, for example. And combining food with other food, especially dairy. Yogurt and fruit doesn't combine well. It can cause all sorts of digestive issues because fruit is digested very easily and quickly and before the dairy and that can cause upsets. Uh, so just be mindful of this and spice things up so that can improve your digestion by for example adding ginger to every meal you eat fresh ginger um so every meal i cook is always full of ginger and i also have fresh ginger tea every day i make a flask full of it in the morning and then um, um yeah that helps me um, get through the day why ginger? Why is ginger so beneficial? It's beneficial for any sort of digestive issues, um, but it helps um, especially well with low appetite. So if you have no appetite, just have a cup of ginger tea and then your appetite may come back at lunch or dinner time. Uh, it helps also with nausea, with uh, acid reflux with gas and bloating, constipation, diarrhea, you name it. It's also anti-inflammatory and a lot of diseases have an inflammatory uh, origin and it has painkilling properties, also not uh, <coughs> um, unimportant. And uh, it uh, balances blood sugar levels and cinnamon does the same. So adding cinnamon to you, for example, your porridge in the morning can be really good, but adding ginger to porridge makes your porridge more tasty as well. And yeah, fennel seeds are also a very good uh, digestive herb um, to uh, improve digestion. If you ever have the feeling that your food is sitting like a heavy brick in your stomach, just take a handful of fennel seeds, put it in your mouth and chew it properly and then swallow it. And this will, you will immediately within a minute feel your food go down. 
So fennel seeds have the property of relaxing our muscles. And also if you have any difficulty swallowing, fennel seeds, chewing fennel seeds can help with that as well. And add more spices and herbs in general to every meal. Fennel seeds can be one of the basic herbs you, you use for your stir fry, for example, but also for stews, for curries, uh, for soups, whatever you cook, or a risotto, for example. Cumin seeds are very beneficial. Um, Penny Greek seeds can be good. Some mustard seeds, as I mentioned before, fresh ginger, garlic, onion. But uh, as you can see later, it can also be a bit tricky for some people with acid reflux, for example, to use garlic and onion. And uh, nigella seeds can also be uh, a good digestive spice to add. And um, usually the seeds uh, are best roasted in some oil before you uh, add the onion, the garlic and the ginger and any other ingredients to your meals because it brings out the flavors. So it will make your kitchen uh, smell really nice, but it also brings out the beneficial properties in the seeds. And you can improve your digestion by having a slice of ginger pickle half an hour before a main meal. How do you make a ginger pickle? Well, you just slice uh, fresh ginger and then you put the slices in a jar. You pour the juice of one whole lime on top of the ginger slices and you add a little bit of rock salt and then you shake it and put it in the fridge and you just take a slice out half an hour before a meal and you chew it. And this will rev up your digestive system um, and make your digestion so much better. So another thing we need to be aware of is when we increase our fiber intake, so I'm promoting eating more vegetables, as you can hear, but we also need to up our fluid intake. And I know that a lot of you will probably have difficulty with drinking enough. So really be aware that this is very important to keep drinking. The best thing is, as I mentioned, to make yourself a flask of some herbal tea, whatever it is. For me, it's ginger tea. I love ginger tea. Make it in the morning and have it with you the whole day round, wherever you go. Have and fill this flask up again when, when it's finished. You know, it's only a 500 milliliter flask. So two of these flasks would be the minimum you need to drink every day. And just sip um, instead of snacking. Uh, I found that I actually don't snack. And I think what helps me resist snacking is actually having my ginger tea at hand wherever I go and just being able to sip on my ginger tea all the time. So that satisfies my need for something. <laughs> Um, why do we need to uh, hydrate as well? Not just because we're upping our fiber intake, but also because we, in order to for the body to be able to produce adequate amounts of stomach acid, digestive enzymes and bile, it needs a lot of fluids. It can't make enough stomach acid if we are dehydrated. Um, so make sure that you hydrate well. And uh, one good way is to start the morning with a morning drink with some warm water um, and add some the juice of half a lime to it and some raw honey. And why raw honey? Because raw honey has got lots and lots of beneficial properties. And once it's been adulterated and with some sugar, it's uh, it loses its uh, benefits. So. I usually buy organic honey because I know that uh, they are not allowed to adulterate it with sugar. But you can also go to a local beekeeper and ask, you know, whether they just take the honey from the beehive and put it straight in a jar. That would also be raw honey. And raw honey is very rich in iron. That's one of the beneficial properties. And lemon is very rich in 
vitamin C. And vitamin C helps the absorp absorption of iron, which helps uh, with which is a very, very important mineral for the thyroid, which is here, a very important gland that regulates our metabolism. And uh, when it doesn't function well, we get weight issues, we get low energy, anxiety, depression, blood sugar imbalances, uh, you name it. A lot of uh, disorders and conditions are linked to poor thyroid function. Drink warm fluids mainly, and I've already mentioned the reason why, because of the blood constriction. Otherwise, especially before a meal, we want lots and lots of blood in the stomach. Avoid drinking during meal times because we don't want to dilute the stomach acid. It needs to really um, be a steady and stable fire in our stomach that breaks down the food. <coughs> and also avoid drinking 30 minutes after a meal unless you're really thirsty, but uh, we just want this acid to be as concentrated as possible um, to break down the food properly. And avoid fizzy drinks and drinks with sugar or artificial sweeteners. Fizzy drinks are not a good idea when you already have gas and bloating and uh, sugar, sugary drinks and artificial sweeteners upset the balance between the good and the bad guys in the gut. And we don't want to feed the bad guys with sugary stuff. So <clears throat> always be aware of that. Any signs that you are dehydrated? Well, you can first of all check your urine. The darker it is, the more you need to drink. And other warning signs that, I, that you are lacking in fluids can be headaches and lightheadedness, bad breath and a dry mouth or a dry tongue, dry lips, constipation and other digestive issues, even diarrhea after not going to the loo for two days, you may get diarrhea because the body may just want to get rid of all the toxins and waste. So diarrhea can actually be a sign of constipation. Low energy can be a warning sign and magnesium, um, is needed um, and uh, is one of the important electrolytes and when you're dehydrated you're also lacking electrolytes. Joint and muscle pain again that's also linked to magnesium. Uh, accelerated heartbeat again linked to magnesium. Magnesium is a very important mineral for heart health by the way and for good kidney health. Yeah don't forget to uh, uh, move enough. Moving, uh, it doesn't have to be exercising, it just can be, you know, like deep breathing also moves um, the lymphatic system and moves toxins and waste through the lymphatic system and eliminates them and gets them out of the body. Um, but movement is another way in which we can make our lymphatic system work, which is our waste disposal system which needs to be clear for our immune system to work properly and not clogged up with undigested protein or fat, for example. So movement also reduces stress and which improves our digestive function. It reduces inflammation. So if you have any inflammatory bowel diseases, colitis, for example, or Crohn's, um, movement is important. It speeds up our metabolism, so it improves thyroid function, reduces constipation, and yeah, I already mentioned that it uh, gets, helps us get rid of toxins. So movement can be anything. It can be gardening, it can be just walking up the stairs, it can be yoga, of course, but it can be just chair exercises, uh, the ones that we offer in regular intervals, and, and just walking. Just try to increase uh, your movement throughout the day and try also to spend 15 minutes at least every day outside um, because that activates uh, serotonin and dopamine in the brain. Although serotonin is produced in the gut, it's released by sunlight in, in the brain. So, and the word on acid reflux and GERD, so any form of indigestion. Um, so contrary to 
um, what people think. Um, acid reflux and GERD are not caused mainly or in most cases by high stomach acid levels, but actually um, to the contrary, they are caused by low stomach acid levels. What happens when our stomach acid levels are not uh, at the right level when we need to digest our food is that our food sits in the stomach uh, longer than it, it usually needs when the stomach acid levels are at the right level. And this stagnating food in the stomach can, especially when you have eaten a large portion, can um, press up, upwards against the sphincter that closes um, the esophagus off from the stomach and that can open up the sphincter and then acid can go up into the esophagus and cause acid reflux. That's one uh, reason why we can have acid reflux. Uh, <coughs> so low stomach acid levels, um, symptoms that can make you aware that you have low, may have low stomach acid levels, can be bloating or any digestive issues, really belching, a lot of gas, indigestion of all, all kinds, diarrhea, constipation, chronic fatigue, and so on, heartburn, hair loss in women, candida or um, what's called small bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, um, and all sorts of uh, nail issues, allergies, food sensitivities, and even skin issues. And some major causes of low stomach acid is age. So as we age, we, our stomach acid levels naturally decrease. So we have to make a make more effort to uh, make sure that our stomach acid levels are adequate. So reduce stress, constant worry, anxiety, and so on, um, which is another major cause of low stomach acid. Irregular eating habits make it very difficult for our body to know when to make adequate levels of these digestive juices. So it's not helpful. Poor diet, as I said, like lots of heavy, dense, uh, difficult to digest food can sit in the stomach too long and um, and uh, yeah, cause low stomach acid. Nutrient deficiencies like zinc and B6 and magnesium. Dehydration because we need a lot of fluids to make uh, enough of these digestive juices and general dryness can cause low stomach acids levels. H. pylori can decrease stomach acid production and certain medication can interfere with uh, stomach acid production as well. Um, so this is a, a picture of the stomach and on the top you can see the esophagus and in the middle uh, between the stomach and the esophagus there is this uh, line and that's, uh, that's where the lower esophageal sphincter is situated that should keep um, reflux uh, <coughs> at bay. But sometimes uh, some trigger foods can relax this sphincter, um, like um, alcohol and caffeinated drinks, for example, or chocolate and uh, peppermint, which is also found in chewing gum. Um, spicy food and acidic food can irritate the stomach and can cause acid reflux. Raw garlic and onion can also be trigger foods. So just be aware when you're eating garlic and onion, you get acid reflux that uh, may be due to you eating garlic and onion. Just check against this uh, list of foods when you have or if you have acid reflux problems. And fatty and fried foods just sits in the stomach too long and can cause stomach acid problems and, and acid reflux. So recommended dietary changes is um, losing weight because that can also relieve the pressure on the sphincter. Avoid overeating and snacking a lot, again, for the same reason. Avoid eating late at night, again, because uh, 
it uh, causes pressure, avoid difficult to digest and common trigger foods, uh, eat healthy fats because um, every cell in our body, as I mentioned before, needs um, to be nourished with healthy fats and also the cells that line uh, that um, actually um, um, build this uh, sphincter and uh, so if we are eating the wrong fats it can make the sphincter weak and if we eat healthy fats that can actually make the membranes the cell membranes stronger and more fluid and that can um, strengthen the barrier between the stomach and the esophagus use of ppis in order to um, decrease stomach acid levels is as you can see not a really good idea if the cause is actually already uh, too low stomach acid levels so just check with your gp whether you really need to be on ppis there are certain conditions when it's recommended but uh, um, long-term use of ppis has been linked to adverse effects such as nutrient deficiencies especially b12 calcium magnesium and iron it has also been linked to increased risk of bone fractures and osteoporosis because of the lack of calcium malabsorption of protein is a big factor risk factor in uh, taking long-term ppis so we need stomach acid to actually be able to digest proteins well and PPIs stop the production of stomach acid and increased risk of infection because stomach acid uh, has also got the function of um, killing uh, foreign invaders like uh, bacteria that can cause food poisoning or viruses that can cause um, pneumonia. Um, so as I said, check with your GP whether PPIs are necessary and whether, or whether the dosage can be reduced. That can also make a difference. Uh, but never stop PPIs on your own accord without checking with your GP and also not abruptly because that can cause acid um, rebound and make the acid reflux even worse. And uh, I usually take uh, use aloe vera uh, when I help clients taper off uh, their PPIs in conjunction with their GPs, of course, um, because aloe vera is a natural um, substance that helps regulate stomach acid levels. When it's when stomach acid levels are too high, it lowers them, and when they are too low, it you know, increase system. And it also is uh, very good for uh, regulating cholesterol levels in the body, improves bowel regularity, reduces inflammation in the GI tract, and it stimulates bile flow, which is also good for digesting fats really well. So, as always, um, the first step can just be um, raising your awareness, becoming aware of what's going on in your body. Um, we don't tend to make changes unless we have a good reason for them. So small steps can really go a long way. And here's uh, my three simple self-care tips to give you some idea of where you could get started uh, with making some changes to your diet and lifestyle. Just breathe more deeply into your belly before and after a meal. Can uh, improve your digestion, as I said, by 25%. Add a rainbow of colors to uh, all your meals, increasing your fiber, but don't forget that you need to up your fluid intake. And the best way to prevent dehydration is to just sip from a flask filled with some nice herbal tea or warm water throughout the day. And if you would like to have more information or some support from us or just stay in touch, here's some ways in which you can uh, connect with us if you uh, would like 
to uh, stay in touch. Thank you very much for listening and um, we'll be back with some other workshop or webinar soon. Bye for now.